welcome to the North Witch Podcast with your hosts, Azario Flame and Sandra Von Holland. In this podcast, we explore all the things that can help us to be better and improve our lives in body, mind, and spirit. Looking at everything from witchcraft, sorcery, woo-woo, spirituality, biohacking, the mundane, and everything in between. We occasionally have on guests from various backgrounds, practices, and philosophies. We welcome everyone from all walks of life, from the left-hand path to the right-hand path, from the medical to the holistic, from the woo-woo to the scientific and everything in between. We have conversations and discussions about our experiences over the years, what works for us, what hasn't worked, and explore new theories and science, trying them out, seeing what works, and debunking what doesn't. Thank you for joining us on this wicked adventure along the crooked path as we adventure into the mysterious and wonderful world and welcome what truly works for us to become better witches, sorcerers, magicians, and our best selves so that we can live our best lives. May these conversations help you to ignite the light within. The views expressed by our guests on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of us here at Northwich Magic Co. All of the information shared on this podcast is anecdotal and shared for entertainment purposes only and does not constitute medical or financial advice. Always consult a doctor, physician, or professional in their field before trying any of the things that may be discussed on this channel. Magic and holistic healing should work alongside allopathic care when necessary. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the North Witch Podcast. On today's episode, we have Jack Grail, who is the author of the wonderfully inspired Hecateon. Uh, it is a devotional hymnal to Hecate and a self-initiatory path. Highly recommend checking that out if you are able to get your hands on a copy. And Jack is also a teacher through the Blackthorn School, where he teaches the PGM Praxis 50 Rights for 50 Nights, as well as Hail Hecate, Walking the Forked Path. So check those out i know that hail hecate is starting another cohort here soon so definitely have a look at that and see what you think how's it going today jack oh it's going great thank you for having me i've been so excited to be invited to northwest appreciate it nice that we are very excited to have you on we've been yeah. taking your pgm class for you know the last few months and it's been <laughs> you know, it, it's been so inspiring and so wonderful to see how your praxis works and how you actually have taken you know these old sorceress technologies that a lot of people find so unreachable and so out of touch with our modern society and you've made it accessible to just about everybody which is absolutely fantastic well it's it's a real privilege to have you in the you in the class because when people join who have a, a practice background and that class attracts a lot of people that are lifelong practitioners and they're devoted you know and they, they have tried out different systems of magic and their experience and it's wonderful to have people like you because when you post your experiences or your results or how you approach the the work it inspires everyone else because as you know the thing about this work is unlike some forms of, you know, I, I, there is a version, it, it is, you know, um, consonant with ceremonial magic. But whereas a lot of ceremonial magic, the practitioners treat it as sort of a binary, you, you do it perfectly or you don't do it at all. The PGM work, the work from the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri allows the practitioner some leeway to be creative. It's flexible, it's fluid, it's a plastic system, it's a hybrid system. And so it allows you to bring to the work your own praxis, you know, and your own, especially if you have a paradigm of spirit work that has worked for you, you can plug that into this work to fill in the blanks in a way that makes sense to you, you know. So it's really cool when we get people that actually have a, you know, a background of sorcery, a background of spirit work, because their work looks different from everyone else's, but it inspires everyone to do their version of the workings. So I, I was so pleased uh, that, that you're in the course. Thank you. Yeah, it's it, it's been great, you know, and like the like you said, to be able to make this so that it's accessible and to be able to work it into your praxis is something that is, you know, you don't see a lot of instruction on how to do that, especially yeah. with, you know, the Greco-Egyptian papyri and, you know, the way that you are able to take some of the spells and, you know, show how, you know, you can use this spell to turn this material into this material and you yeah. can use this spell to get this material for this <laughs> spell. And, you know, it, right. you just, you, you make it a, a lifestyle almost rather than just, you know, like you say, a ceremonial thing where, yeah. you know, it has to be perfect or else, which is yeah. beautiful. Well, it, it's part of the misconception too of this work that it's all about, you need 
entire mummies and dead cats and, and bowls of ox blood and things like that to do it, which isn't the case, as you know. You know, most many of the spells require are just verbal. Some many of the spells just require a, a, a nail or a piece of garlic. Lots of spells require seven, you know, the, one of the most potent ones requires seven pieces of bread. You know, like it's there's there's they're doable from a practical standpoint. What they require, of course, from an emotional standpoint, from an artistic standpoint, is this sense of performative creativity where you approach the material and say, all right, I'm going to go do this. This is the night of the new moon or Orion's out tonight or I'm going to go out under the Pleiades and do this work. This is the, the hour of Venus or this is the day of Jupiter, you know, or this is I have access to that that three-way path that splits in the wood and, and tonight's the night. The kids are off you know, with their friends and, and my partner's out. I'm going to do it. And that sense of rising excitement as you approach the work and that sense of that thrill and that fear as we push the envelope with this material to reach out to the unseen world and experience that sensation of something reaching back. I mean, to me, there's nothing like that, you know, and this work allows that to happen without you know, nine months of abstinence without, you know, having to have a solid gold sword, without having to be born the seventh son of a seventh son. It allows that process to happen for those people who are willing to make the first move, you know, and take the first step. And that's why it's exciting to me, because it also requires a bit of creativity and, of course, a bit of risk on the practitioner's part to decide to engage. So... <laughs> I think I love your style of teaching. You make it very welcoming for beginners and oh. that it's, you take the scare out of it. Yeah. So in my little bit of experience with <laughs> Azariel yeah. hooked me up, but he's been after me for months to get on this course. And I just, I have a lot of other things. So it just yeah. never worked out. So, and then once I plugged in, I was like, are you kidding me? Why didn't I do this? Like it's, <laughs> you take the scare out of it, honestly. Like your style of teaching is very incredible it's very touching and um kind of all-encompassing like so you would it's easy you're an easy to listen to instructor that you get it you don't try and make it too grandioso or anything yeah. you are but whereas azariel and all his experience you still are captivating to him so you are all-encompassing instructor <laughs> for sure Good. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Like, that means a lot to me because what a lot of people, what I know and for myself, a, a big part of the, the surprise with this work is because it's not based on being able to meditate for two hours or create complicated, you know, mental psychic images or astral this or visionary that, it's relational spirit work. And if you can have a relationship with a person, you can have a relationship with a person you can't see. We do it all the time with people that are remote or people over the phone or people who passed away two years ago that we still talk to, you know? And if you can manage that, and most people can, then you can have a relationship with a power that you call forth that doesn't have a body. And so what most people find is they already have the skills. Like you don't have to, you know, this talk of witch blood and this, that, and the other. It doesn't apply in this case. The work, the workings work if you do them in the same way that we reach out to each other, you know, taking the time, preparing, being sincere, offering yeah. something of value, receiving respectfully what you're giving, being patient, even with people, you don't always get exactly what you want every time right away. And with people, we understand that. We're like, well, we've met four times. He's interested in my project. He's not willing to commit financially, but we have a meeting next month. Everyone knows that that's like the way it works for things you really want. But with spirits, you're like, I did it once, nothing happened. After that, like, what type and set. It's like, wait a minute, <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't teach someone at the PTA like that. Like, why don't you, why don't you do it twice? You know, why don't you repeat it? Why don't you offer something new? Why don't you pick a different night? Why don't you approach it from a different angle? And for those that do, there's this deepening of the praxis that you find. You say, okay, well now I've, I sort of feel I've felt more comfortable with it. Because it's awkward anytime you do something the first time, you know, I myself, I stumble over the words, the magical voices, it's hard to read them in the dark, the lights fading, the winds blowing the thing, I stumble over them. I'm like, God, that was rough. And I think, you know what, I'm gonna do the whole thing again from scratch. I just do it twice. When it, second time feels more comfortable. Third time I start getting out of my head, I stop worrying, you know, is there someone walking their dog down the path? I stop worrying, am I pronouncing some stuff wrong? It starts, you start to settle into it. And it feels like you can focus on, on actually what you're saying instead of how you're saying it. And that's, and that's normal. 
And most of us, that's the exciting part is most of us have the skills to do this work if there's the will to do it. So I'm so glad that you found that, that it you know seemed approachable, right? Good. Very much. And I think, don't we all have to say all the pronunciations wrong? I don't know how you know how to read all that stuff. And I say that to Azariel all the time. I'm like, I don't even know what that says. And he's always right. he's like, it's well, okay, it, you'll get it. It's okay. Yeah, right. Well, I, I know, and it, it, if it doesn't matter, I'm going to probably mispronounce Azariel's name the entire time, but I assume he'll still let me be on his show. <laughs> there's, there's a bit of like assumption of good faith involved. <laughs> I'll do my best, <laughs> you know, uh, so, yeah. Well, so. And I think that's what you really put across is that it is about good faith. Yeah. I don't, like you just, mm. it doesn't have to be perfect to do. No. And that's really encouraging to many, I think. It's funny how much of a binary mindset we're in. And, and a lot of people, even if they would say nowadays, oh, I don't think sexuality is binary, or I, I don't think this is binary, they're still binary about their, their magical practice. Well, it's either going to work or it doesn't. Or they're, magic, they're binary about the, the method. Well, I want to do it right. I don't want to do it wrong. Or they're binary about the deity. Are they a good deity or a bad deity? You know, right. you know is it gonna is it going to be successful? Is it going to not? Am I see results or I not see results? It's like all of that's binary. All of it. And if you can believe that's who someone's attracted to can be not one or two things, but three or four or, or, or something in between, then you can believe there's not just two right ways, a right and a wrong way. There's not just success and failure. The God's not either good or bad. You're not either going to succeed or fail. There's going to be a gradually leaning into this method of calling upon the unseen world and becoming alive to what you receive in return that's going to enrich your life that's going to gradually deepen your understanding of, of the world and your place in it and, and allow you to feel in relation to things in a way that you haven't been before and to, in a way, sacralize and give meaning to the mundane to where you start seeing epiphanies in everyday life and you start observing your own reactions, physical reactions to the work and start to recognize spirit presence, not through you know, glowing visions, which few of us have, but through the, the rapid beat of the heart, or as Robert Graves would say, the, you know, the prickle of hair at the back of the neck and the, sh the shiver, that frisson of, of the imminence of power. And to sort of discover that you are, you know, however, like me, you might think that you're you know, not sensitive to those things as many are, you start to discover you can be in relation to them because you can observe them. It just takes patience and it is working. It's working on its own terms, in its own time, in its own way. And you're part of that. And it's exciting, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one thing that I found really cool about the way that you teach is, you know, like when you're teaching the invocations, whether it be to Hecate or it be to Typhon Set or whoever, you know, when you call the spirit, the spirit does come and you need to, you know, and then you say, well, now what do you do about it? So what you being, you know, just Jack and you don't have these great epiphanies and, you know, you're not off doing astral battle with all of these <laughs> spirits, you know, how do you, how did you begin to notice that, you know, maybe Hecate was presenting herself to you or maybe Typhon Set was coming or how did you how did you begin to work with the spirits and know that they were there and know that they were responding to your call? Well, as I've said before, I don't see spirits. So it, 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 it part of the challenge is trying to feel get over that hump that a lot of um, inexperienced people make, like I made early on, which is if you don't visually see something, then nothing came. You have to understand, of course, that you're calling something without a body. So not to see a body isn't necessarily a failure. Right. And some people, what you do gradually realize what helps is keeping track of your physiological responses to the working and also what phenomenal responses happen. You can say, all right, I went out to this crossroads. I made the offering. I read the thing. Nothing really happened. You're like, all right, well, what did happen? So, well, I, I stumbled a bit halfway through because I heard my dog barking behind me halfway through. Mm -hmm. And then I lost my own words because there was this ambulance that went by kind of ruining the moment. And then I got this creepy feeling, like maybe that there was some people at the park and the, the hair of the back of my neck stood up. And that night I had a weird dream about my grandmother. So it basically it didn't work. And you say, you know, that's the beginner's response, right? And as people have done this for a while, you start to realize, well, wait a minute, a dog barking is the epiphany of Hakate's presence. It doesn't matter if it was your dog or someone else's dog or a mystery dog or an invisible dog, a dog barking is her epiphany. And again, an ambulance, what is an ambulance? An ambulance is a sign that someone is 
at the, the borderline of life and death, someone's in terrible danger. And the people who drive an ambulance are the ferry people. They, they transport the living either to the world of death or to the world of you just barely recovered, right? They are in a way psychopomps in what they do. You know, the fact that the, you felt the heart pound or the prickles rise, it's easy to say, well, I thought, I thought there might've been a jogger or someone you know, out there that made me nervous. It's like, all right, but you still had a physiological response, the pounding of the heart, the prickling at the back of the neck, that thrill of concern or fear that you've been spotted or that there's a homeless person or whatever. It's still a physiological response. And then at the end of it, you had this dream. What was the dream of? Well, this matriarchal figure spoke to me, but it's my grandmother and I hate her. It doesn't matter. You had a vision that night of someone. What did they say? Who is your grandmother to you? You know, why, how did that plug in? So there's work to be done, you know? And it, what it makes you do is it makes you, and it took me a long time to realize it, it makes you look at things with new eyes and listen with new ears and be aware of stuff and to constantly ask, okay, I understand you don't think that mattered what happened afterwards, but what if it did? What if it did? Could this have been an epiphany? Well, of course not. It was my friend. He showed up. I told him not to click on. He was late. I started without him and he showed up halfway through. It's like, okay, but someone still arrived halfway through the working, didn't they? What did he say to you? that epiphany, right at that, what moment did he appear? Well, he appeared at the moment of the conjuration. You know, what it does is it allows us to look again at the skein, the mundane skein of our life and detect from the noise, the signal of the divine. And it's like a game in some ways, but it's also like a wonderful challenge, a puzzle to figure out. And then you, of course, repeat it. You see, does it happen again? What happens the next time you do it? The third time you do it, you're like, all right, well, every time I do it now, I get this prickle at the back of my neck at this certain point. Every time I do it now, it's not always an ambulance, but then there was a, I thought I heard a gunshot once, or there was an owl that swooped overhead. And you start to assemble, especially if you keep track of it, if you have a journal or something, you start to assemble the epiphanies associated not just with Hakati in practice, what happens if you call Typhon set? Well, you know, I've, I've had, you know, been in, you know, friendships with people who do that. And they say, I find rusty objects everywhere. My throat is constantly swollen. I can't, you know, my eye, I can't see out of my left eye. I've had huge luck in this part of my life. It's very sethi and I have, a, but I'm always kind of overheated and, you know, I feel inflamed. I got these weird fevers and yet other people are deferring to me. I keep seeing hawks. I keep seeing, you know, um, you know, on the roadside, hawks plucking at, uh, at, at roadkill. I keep finding, I keep cutting myself. It's like, okay, well, all of those things have a resonance with that Sethian current, you know, inflammation, fever, severance, you know, the, the worlds of, of competition and dominance and rebellion, and bloodshed, and all those things. So a large part of it, you know, is just telling people it's not about being magic -y. We're all just human. The power comes from what we invoke. The best thing we can do is be alive to how it's in our life, to be open-minded as to how it appears and to be you know, curious enough and patient enough to monitor our results and what happens and build on our successes and allow some time to pass with patience and, you know, and observance to let it work, you know, let the process work. Otherwise, as a person, you know, they take Prozac the first day, like, I don't feel any better. I'm going off it. <laughs> it's going to take a while. Give it a chance to work, you know, so. Absolutely. You know, and, and being a martial artist, I always m make magic akin to martial arts when I describe it. Yeah. You, know, you wouldn't go to your first lesson as a right. white belt and be like, why in the hell am I not breaking bricks? Why can't I beat this black belt in this tournament? You know, you would go true. back. People do go the first time and they want to break bricks in the first class. Well, also, and I'll, I'll add to what Sandra just said. I'll, a part of me thinks, one of the great things about this work for people on the fence, but beginner's luck is a thing. You know, beginner's luck is a thing. And often I think people that actually approach it for the first time sometimes get the most startling successes and epiphanies, you know, soon after or during or even before the working than people that have been at it for years. And I don't know why it is, but you're, I mean, you're totally right. You have to approach it with a, a long-term mindset. But the weird bonus is for people that take this up, they often find surprising amounts of success early on in a way that sometimes startles them. Well, I think in a lot of times, um, and I'm just speaking from me, 
we don't know what we don't we don't know really like it's been azariel right. saying mom where do you think i get this from like i've been doing this forever but i didn't yeah. know i was doing anything because wow. it's just me it's just what i do and yeah. and you do um we pay attention we don't know that we're not supposed to pay attention i don't do it with to the extent that he does by any means i mean mm -hmm. he's amazing at what he does and i don't call spirits all like with i don't do hecate and all of them i just have my people that come yeah. i just so i've never labeled anything so to actually finally listen to him and actually go further and learn more and why and how and it's quite awesome so i actually believe that there is so many more people like me that we just do we don't need to yeah. we never have needed labels and we never needed to call on the certain whoever we've never needed that it just we just do does that make sense to you oh, it like, does it does did you by the way did you hear the hecate and epiphany of dogs barking as soon as you mentioned uh, her name i think you should definitely <laughs> build on your successes clearly you have a skill <laughs> i always think too i always think too that women have an easier time with this work they're more i generally the ones i've known have been more intuitive have a, have a better sense of spirit presence have easier access to those thonic worlds that we call from and have a more liminal uh, apprehension i think as I speak for myself as a guy, sometimes I feel like I have to work harder to get less, but I'm content with that. And uh, so it it makes sense to me to hear what you say. And I, I believe it 100%. Well, and as Ariel noticed, like from very, very young, um, I was, uh, was always hiding and protecting, right? And it's yeah. like, well, mom, don't you see him right there? I'm like, you see him? <laughs> so <laughs> it's been an interesting growth that we've had together. And we've he's been so much more open and obviously gone miles and miles and miles with it and it's been incredible so it's it's kind of fun to sort of actually pay attention and embrace it now with him and and it's that's all really good. cool that's really cool that you have that together oh. so jack i was just reading your book again last night which is uh you know honestly one of the most beautiful works of art in the Hecatean current that I have worked with. And, you know, it, you can really truly see how much passion you put into it. But the big thing that really stands out is your huge use of the sorceress technologies of the papyri and, you know, how you've adapted mm. that into your own uh, self-initiatory yeah. path. So how did you start discovering how that worked for you and what made you decide to start using you know like the egyptian style invocations and things like that what what kind of made that click for you you know there's and you know for people that aren't familiar with them the the pgm the greco-egyptian magical papyri have as you know hundreds of spells many of whom are embedded with egyptian words or greek epithets or sometimes Roman or Persian or, or Hebraic words thrown into it. And these are often in long strands, sometimes intermixed with vowel sounds and, and animal sounds and things like that. And when you first read it, you're like, what the hell is all of this stuff? Like, I can't tell what this is. I don't speak this language. And some of them can be interpreted and a footnote might clarify it, but many of them can't. And they seem to be a mishmash of old Egyptian or Coptic or things like that. And so there's a sense of, well, as a practitioner, what do we do with this? Because I'm not a 1,700-year-old Egyptian. <laughs> now, now, the different people have different solutions. You know, my friend Jeff Collins says, you skip it because you want to know what you're saying and say what you mean and mean what you say. I like to say the words because to me, the PGM refers to these words as names. And it's very clear for the ones we can translate that they're names of spirits. Oftentimes they're epithets of gods and goddesses. Sometimes they're epithets that we don't know which god or god is they associate with. There's a great one, son of darkness, um, soul of darkness. It seems to be Bacchus Kuka. And, um, and it's like, well, who is that? Is that Osiris or is it some other thonic deity? It's hard to tell. But the technology of the spell doesn't explain that you have to know who you're calling for it to work. If I call 911 here, because there's an emergency, I don't have to know the name of the person that picks up the phone to get the police to come. I just have to dial 911. If I dial 912, no one's coming, even if I know their last name and life history and whatever. There's a protocol to getting help. The spells in the PGM have a protocol. You do this, you do that, you say these words, and you, and you know, and then you you the spirit comes. 
The spirit always comes, whether you perceive it or not, whether it's receptive or not, you know, that mileage may vary. But the exciting thing about these spells is these magical voices, whether they're Greek or Egyptian or whatever, by reciting them, because many of them can't be translated, and even those that can, to recite words that aren't our own in a tongue that's not our own. It gives one, it starts to affect the mind on a non-rational, sub-rational, hyper-rational way. It's trance-like reciting these words because they're not you speaking anymore. It's you saying a name. And like any word that you recite repeatedly till it loses the logic of it, these names themselves do two things. One, they put us in a different mindset. And two, since they are names, they call a spirit. Yeah, they call a spirit. And so... When I noticed the power of these words, when I started writing my own hymns, I would um, incorporate those words, some of them carefully chosen into my own writings because I wanted those spirits from that spell helping the practitioner in my spell. Here's, a, here's an example. I'm going to grab my book and flip it to. This is one of the spells people are supposed to recite an invocation for people doing what I call the nine day rite, which is a nine day ritual to commit to Hakati in practice. It's, a, it's just a page long, if you don't mind me reading it. Um, and I'll, I'll read it and then I'll talk about what the, the, the magical words are. So you're calling upon Hakate and you say, Oh, indomitable darkness that dwells in the heart of light. Oh, formless fire that informs the womb of night. O oh, woman astride an open grave, giving birth to life. O oh, child with a dog's face, whose left hand is a knife. Polymorphos, polyprosopos, afratos, apletos, anessa, anessa, hecate. And um, there's more along those lines, right? But so the chorus is well, words in Greek, and um, they mean many formed, many faced without a name, um, queen, queen, Hakate, unknowable. And so, and um, it's important to notice, they're, they're not even in, they are Greek epithets, they're, they're not even in proper, you know, they're, they're not in the proper, uh, you know, uh, a tense, they could be improved. But the point is, it doesn't matter. I use them as magical voices. They're meant to call upon different epithets of Hakate. Interestingly, Within the console, they both have two, two functions. One, to draw her closer, to show, hey, I know something about you, and I'm going to recite it in the language in which you were invoked early on. But two, these epithets are in some ways like separate entities of her. It's just like there's a version of you that's a professional businessman, and a version of you who's a son and a child, and a version of you, you know, who's a partner, and a version of you who's best friend or whatever. There's different sides of you, and sometimes they're quite different from the other, one to the other. These epithets, these facets of the great jewel that is the deity are each in each way different. And so to call them, that aspect comes closer. So if you're to call Hecate, it matters whether you're gonna use the epithet Brimo, which is the, the burning one, the boiling one, the furious one, which was used in the illusion mysteries to dispel, dispel deities, hear the epiphany. And also, or it's different if you call upon her by the name Atalos, meaning compassionate, you know, someone who did, you know, and you could combine them, but the, you know, the, it, it would be ideal to have a situation where you both need a compassionate and a ferocious ally, you know? So, so my use of these words and, um, and my incorporating them into my own work came from an awe of them and a wonder at them, the mystery of them. There's not a science, it's more art than science, how they work and whether they work and in what combinations they work. There's an intuitive process, an artistic process. And everyone who approaches these would have a different aspect and would reach their own successes, you know. But that's why I found them. I find them wonderfully powerful and, and really effective. Now, Jack, one of the things that uh, we had asked was, uh, and it, it plays well into you using the Vocus Magicae from the Papyri, is do you have to say the barbarous names exactly? And, you know, to, to my mind, I, you know, being here in Canada, listening to me talk is a lot different than listening to somebody in Newfoundland talk. So, yeah, sure. you know, right. like, so, so do you find that pronunciation makes a difference or do you find that getting more to how you feel that word is what makes the difference? It's a good question. I think the answer is to the extent that you can recite them the way they, they, they maybe should have been pronounced, one should do it. 
many of them we can't recapture exactly how they spoke without a time machine and a tape recorder. And then I think the best we do is just swing for the fences and do what we can, right? And there's certain rules we, we can kind of follow as far as how to pronounce certain words. But Eve, it should be noted, <clears throat> the PGM spells themselves were not all written by one person. And you can tell that the different people who recorded these spells spoke differently, because oftentimes the same magical word is spelled differently when different people are writing it down, indicating they're pronouncing it differently. Because when you were spelling back then, you were literally writing what you heard. You know, so, you know, when when different people would call a power and they use different words to different letters to spell it, you realize they're not always pronouncing it the same way. And sometimes you can tell they might have had a dialect. This might have been a Persian magician. This might have been a Jewish magician. This person might have been, you know, a, you know, a very experienced one versus a newer one reciting. They, they do it differently. I do think, you know, there's a there's a, a quote from. Iamblichus is on the mysteries where his word of advice for theurgists is don't translate them, especially Egyptian words. He said, don't use them in their original tongue. Um, that was his advice. He found that said that there was power. And people thought back then that Egyptian culture was the magical premier culture of the, of the ancient world. And the Egyptian language itself was a magical language. And so it made sense that he's saying that. We feel that way about Greek, like those epithets I used for Greek, but they didn't think that back then. <laughs> they thought Greek was a, was a rocky hill country where there were a lot of goats and it wasn't that, you know, and it was an upstart country where they changed everything every other decade, as opposed to Egyptian, you know, millennia or, you know, uh, Near Eastern, we have a millennia of tradition informing their spirituality. So we find, you know, it in Greek powerful. They would have said, oh, it's all about the Egyptian words, you know? So I, it's a self-serving way, but I just say, I, I use them using the best rules of pronunciation I can, and I trust that it's going to work out. And I, I trust the principles in place. When I get an email from someone in Italy and every other word is in English is misspelled, I don't just hit delete. My first reaction is, oh, it's, you know, they're struggling with the language. My second one is, well, what do they have to say? You know, and you trust to a certain degree that the spirit power will have the same response. You know, so they, I think good, good faith goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> making the attempt right for sure and so i see that you use a lot of the uh kind of egyptian influences with your hecatean work what what kind of inspired that and what what uh what mileage have you gotten with that have you noticed that oh. it's in fact more powerful or you know here's here's the thing that there's a big misapprehension i had it when i started out but a lot of people have it too it's just that Hecate is a Greek goddess, right? The Greek goddess called Hecate, 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 whatever. She's a Greek goddess. So if you're going to worship her, you have to worship all the Greek gods or that, that's it. What people don't realize is there's, there's a couple of two or three nice prayers to Hecate from Hellenic culture. Orphic hymn, you know, uh, hymn to, to Janus and, and Hecate from Roman. And then there's a couple of great prose pieces, the Homeric hymn to Demeter and Hesiod's Theogony that show her acting as guide to Persephone and, and fulfilling a function in the Eleusian, what became the Eleusian mysteries. But almost all of the magic spells invoking Hecate are African, which is to say they're from Thebes, they're the PGM, they're, they're taken from the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri, which were dug up from a tomb in Thebes. Thebes is not northern Egypt. Thebes is in southern Egypt. You know, Thebes is close uh, to Nubia. Thebes was the cult center of Egypt, and its prime had 40,000 priests alone. It was where you went for pilgrimage and stuff like that. And there's other people say, oh, well, that's Egyptian, not African. But this comes to this racist and disproven theory that people had 100 years ago because the Egyptians were so comp, uh, accomplished. You know, a lot of white scholars said, well, they must have been kind of a white race that came to northern Africa and subdued the darker races. But this is a bunch of nonsense. They were the same ethnic group as the northern Africans in the countries that surrounded them. So that means that these spells, which were written under Roman rule after there been a few centuries of Hellenic influence after Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, but these spells were an expression of an indigenous African magical tradition that was expressed within the context of a hybridized culture 
that came after Hellenic and Roman rule, right? And there were a bunch of Jews living there too. And there was a Persian influence. There were Gnostic Christians when this stuff was written because it was written about the third century AD. There were, there were all kinds of influences and this magic reflects it because the magic of the PGM is street magic. It's outlaw magic. It wasn't legal to perform in Rome. And it would have been probably performed by Egyptian priests or lectors or scribes on their off hours for a clientele sort of under the table calling upon sometimes Egyptian gods, sometimes Greek gods, sometimes a synthesis of the two, sometimes Hebraic angels, sometimes Gnostic aspects of the demiurge like Abrasax and Yahweh. And so it's this wonderful, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hybrid, it's an alloy of different spiritual traditions, but it was done originally by Africans for Africans. And so it's a great privilege uh, to perform it because it comes from, you know, a, a tradition that, that really isn't European. So the exciting thing is a lot of this, if you choose to do anything other than simple Hellenic devotional work, if you choose to delve into the, the prayer to Selene or the hymn to the waning moon or the call to, to gladiators and heroes that died young or any number of the more than a dozen spells to Hecate and the PGM, you're engaging with a spiritual tradition that references, you know, a goddess that arose in Anatolia in southwestern Turkey, but you're doing it through a spell written by an African sorcerer for an African client, probably aimed at an African target, and you're part of that tradition now, you know. So it's a wonderful thing, and it's a great encouragement to people of color that might be attracted to Hakate, but might say, well, I don't want to, you know, I feel a little weird worshiping a European goddess. It, it's beyond that, you know, her power transcends borders and boundaries. She doesn't have a race. She doesn't have body, right? And so it's a, it's a wonderful aspect of the PGM work that allows us to cross cultural boundaries and, and racial borders and practice with these people from 2000 years ago, a brilliant type of magic that references, you know, Western Hellenic tradition from the context of a North African magical uh, standpoint. Quite cool. That was very cool, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I I don't think a lot of people even realize that that is there. You know, you hear yeah. Hecate, and it's instantly people go to the Greek pantheon, right? right. So it's right. But it, you know, like like you say, it's in Africa. We we see epithets of her from Persia. We, you know, she 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 got around. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, right. Right. so that's a very very cool way to you know work with that and look at it. Um, now, we do have a question here from a listener for you, Jack. Oh, sure. Since we were just talking about the Puri, I thought it would be good to ask you now. Um, what is your favorite PGM spell and why? You know, that's a great question. And I have to say, it's hard to choose because they all have different resonances. You know, it's like asking what your favorite song is. It depends on what your mood is that day and, you know, whether it's something raucous or something soothing. I will say... I will say this because there's, I'm tempted to lean into the obvious ones like the, the prayer to Selene is so, you call upon a conflation of Hecate and Selene, the lunar goddess, who's both Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end of all creation. This bull-horned goddess who bellows like a bull and barks like a dog and hisses like a serpent and crackles like fire and is the, you know, carries the triple flames at the triple crossroads and rules the triple decades. And she's just, it's a magnificent invocation. So I'm, I lean toward that, and then I lean toward the, the prayer to the waning moon, which is, of course, a baneful work in calling upon Hecate in her, in her most, uh, you know, malefic aspect. And by all these, you know, her aspects as a, as a bringer of madness and a goddess of the, the crossroads who rules um, restless spirits and all that. So there's, I mean, those are the two that, that first appear. But the, but the fact is that there's two, two of my favorites aren't Hecatean at all, really. One of them, and it's one of the first ones we do in the PGM class, you know, I love the hymn to the serpent-faced God, which is a great, despite its, you know, its off-putting name, it's a, you know, it's a great call to the serpentine power of fruitfulness, of a fruitful harvest, of an agatha diamond, a good spirit that benefits your household, that makes your efforts, you know, have full of results. And you call upon it, and it's, and it's a wonderful, it, it's a wonderfully simple piece. You burn a bit of snakeskin and you call upon this power that's meant to make what you do fruitful. I love that one. And I also love 
the great spell that um, we call Kronos, called the little mill, where you go outside and you have a little salt grinder and you grind salt as you call upon Kronos. And it has the instructions in it that when you hear chains clanking at his approach, you know he's come, which is a terrifying, <laughs> it's a terrifying instruction. But it's but both of those are short, they're simple, they have magical voices, and they call upon these powers that see what I love, love about it is both these powers, Kronos, the embodiment of 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 time and to some degree sort of Saturnian coldness, darkness, danger, you know erosion, atrophy, entropy. You would think a power like that would be so foreign that to, to reach out to it would require six months on a mountaintop, starving yourself and everything else. But it's simple. It's simple. It's frighteningly simple how to contact that power. And the, the serpent-faced God, this one, it's not even it, it, you know, in, in envisioned as a human entity it's it's something that is cosmic almost and um and yet it's simple and these two spells along with other ones there's a there's a spell to the bear constellation and there's um some spells that are to solar and lunar to begin or end your day with solar and lunar invocations a lot of these we start within the class they're so simple they don't require a bunch of stuff it's the words, it's the will, it's the action, it's the time you took, it's the reception afterwards. And it's a great reminder that this work is performable by anyone and the results are manifest. It simply requires the effort and deciding to yourself, I'm gonna extend that hand in the darkness and see if something takes it. And in my experience, very often something does. That's absolutely see, <laughs> see, listeners. I told you he's a great, great teacher. He yeah. reaches everybody. I'm glad you think so. I bet our listeners are going to be captivated. They get you need to put your comments in when you agree with me on this, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely a beautiful way of looking at it. And so now, Jack, we had another question, you know, with uh how a lot of the materia in the papyri is seems very very out of touch you know like some of them you need the skull of an ass some of them you need you know the blood of a dove and you know there's some of these things that people find so out of touch with the way that we live our life today now do you have any recommendations or suggestions for how somebody new to the papyri would work around these seemingly impossible things to still make the magic happen and to make it work for them yeah yeah it's a good it's a good question. It's funny because the ones that you mentioned, <laughs> they're, they're all from malefic magic. So you can see someone going, well, shit, how am I supposed to do all this malefic magic without the skull of a dog? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Look at how hard these things are to get. All I want to do is kill someone and I got to find the blood of a black dog. <laughs> the question is kind of funny. But second of all, I have the skull of an ass here. It cost me about $75. So it's not impossible to get some of this stuff. But the answer too is, I mean, there's twofold answer. <clears throat> One of them is, if there's something you really want to do and you don't have the stuff, most stuff can be found, let's be honest. But if you really don't have it, if you understand the principle behind it, which is part of what we talk about in the class, you can come up with your own substitutes. Now, that's something you would never hear a you know, pure ceremonial magician say. Like, well, you can substitute, you know, butter knife for the sword, you know, consecrated by the, you know, mass of the Holy Spirit. But the point is, in this work, because the PGM might list, let's look at, talk about malefic spells, which those examples come from. The PGM might have, oh God, you know, it might have 10, pick any 10 spells mm -hmm. that are malefic magic, right? And what you see is you start, if you lined them up, you start to see a pattern, which is we talk about in the class. You say, okay, you know, say seven of these spells are calling Typhon Set, let's say, yeah? And each one is asking him to, to bind an opponent, right? And it's like, all right, the first one, requires blood of an ass and then it requires uh that you you know burn you know some you know dung type incense mm -hmm. and it also requires some kind of spicy food something like that like all right well what's the second one well the second one you need the blood you need the skull of an ass and you also need um the uh the hair of a black dog but you also need to burn something different 
that's smelly and, and thing. And you certainly need a fire to overheat an image. But what's the third one do? Well, the third one, you need the tooth of an ass. And you also need the water collected from the footprint of a black dog. And you also need something different that's smelly and, and a certain herb that's red. I'm like, all right, what about the fourth one? Well, this one, you need the image of a donkey. And you also need, it needs to be done at a place, you know, where a dog, you know, where, there, where there's a dog to bark. And it also needs to have uh, a type of like al alcohol or something, some kind, of, some kind of drink that's really spicy. What's the next one? Well, this one, you need to call upon these names, calling him as an ass, and you need to bark like a dog. And you need to, um, you know, again, offer something spicy. You also need to offer some of your own blood. You're like, okay, well, let's look at those five things. Where do they intersect? If we're going to do a Venn diagram, right? Something donkeyish, not surprising, because one of the aspects of Typhon's set is the ass. Something dogish, not surprising, because there's uh, oftentimes the, the Hecatian and the Sethian spells are adjacent to each other. Yeah. And, and black dogs, dogs would, you know, jackals would prowl cemeteries. So they had a, you know, they, they, they sort of an association with the restless dead. These spells will probably require some sort of materia, you know, either a piece of someone who died young and violently, or soil from their grave, or water from their shipwreck, or a tool that killed them, or something from the, the place they're either buried or the kill site, but something of a restless spirit. And then you got something spicy and something stinky. So you can define it. You say, okay, there, there's consistencies here, but it's different each time. It's not a skull of a donkey each time. It's not exactly the blood of a black dog each time. It's something doggish. It's something donkeyish. It could be a tooth, a skull, a blood, an image. And so the dog, sometimes we have a piece of the dog, and sometimes we bark like a dog. So you ask yourself, what if I braid like a donkey and drew one on papyrus in the ink that's myrrh with a bit of red, red ink, because set red is a very Sethian color, right? What if I you know, call upon the magical voices? Each one would have magical voices associated with set, your airbreath, your pak airbreath, your bull, you know, uh, and uh, say, I'll, I'll layer it with these magical voices. I'll combine these three. And since I don't have a donkey skull, I'll draw the image of a donkey, um, right? I'll use red ink or I'll create one out of clay. And then, and, and I'm going to, and, but then someone listening to this be like, we're well, just making up stuff. It's like, no. These sorcerers were working under very specific protocols. These spells weren't all different. There's a sameness to them. There's a similarity, but you can see them using, it's like jazz. It's like hearing three different jazz artists play a riff on Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It's not gonna sound, you'll be able to detect Over the Rainbow. But none of them will sound like each other. And that's their strength. It's not their weakness. That's what these sorcerers are doing. They're riffing on the ideas here. They're incorporating something Sethian that's either physical or visual or verbal. They're combining something of the dead that's either of their body or where they were killed or where they were buried. They're incorporating similar sets of magical names that call forth that power of Seth that's violent and, 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 uh, and, and, um, and powerful. They're incorporating something that smells Sethian, acidic. They're incorporating heat, which is associated with them in the flame or holding something over a flame to warm it and heat it till it's quite hot or till it catches fire. They're incorporating an offering, it might be spicy and, and, and all that. And so when you see this pattern, you think, okay, now I know what to do. And based on my resources and my creativity, and my inspiration, I'm going to create a spell that incorporates these elements, yeah. And we're able to do that because this system of African slash Egyptian magic, in it, the worker takes on the role of the demiurge. That's why the magic works. The magic, the work is done by spirits, but who can call a spirit a relation, someone who's related to the spirit? And typically, Egyptian priests from thousands of years before the PGM was created, when they were to do a working like this, they would self-announce, I am Heka. And Heka was both the god of magic and magic itself. Heka was the oldest, eldest born of the gods. So the, 
the, the, the magician, the, the priest, and they were kind of indiscernible in, ma in Egyptian tradition, would declare themselves to be the eldest born of the gods, the one who made the magic happen, literally. And then they would go about fashioning a spell using the accepted component parts, invocation, compulsion, and often a declaration of a god face, which is why this magic is often, you know, which is the sign that the magic, you're making the magic work, because often the practitioner will say, I am Hermes Doth, and that's why this will come to pass. Or I am, you know, O Typhon Set, I am your general, probably meaning uh, Set. Uh, I am, you know, the one who cries out, you know, and needs your, you know, I am your right hand, I am your son, I am your servant, or I am the great God, such and such, I am. And so those declarations, people nowadays feel kind of queasy saying, but it's part of that tradition to say, I'm capable of structuring this spell and performing this spell, because I'm not trying to fool anyone. But when you declare that you are something, within this world, you become it because you're a demiurge. So what you do is you become the lens through which the power flows. You don't become the beam of sunlight, but you become the magnifying lens, which converts it to something that can burn. And so you use the words to declare your own Godhead, to call forth the magical voices as if you're calling your, your siblings, your younger siblings and asking them to do something. You declare confidently, this will happen. And here's what I have to offer you. And here's what the result I need. And then there's certain protocols in these spells where you, you recognize their genealogy, you recognize their associations, you point out you're doing this maybe on the right day or with the right offerings to show that you, you've done your research and you're, you're, you're worthy of their respect and attention because you're not, you're not you know, taking the process lightly. You often offer something to them and you may even call someone hire them to say, make sure this happens because I know you are even higher than the person I'm calling and I want to be sure that this happens. So it can have a hierarchy to it like in ceremonial magic. You know, so if you look at that as a whole, it's all doable. And what's exciting is it allows you to make substitutions and to be creative and fashion a spell by sort of mish mashing together three, just like a musician might mash together its two favorite songs, you know, to blend to each other. It lets you do that. And it's part of the tech. And so that's part of why this work is doable even for people that see an ingredient and like, ah, smells great, but there's one ingredient I don't have. Do it anyway. Use your creativity. What can you substitute? Why is it in there in the first place, right? That's fantastic. That's great advice. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give it like a, just a quick, a quick example of just riffing on that. You know, some spells will say, start with a, a spell, say drown a cat. It's like, well, wait a minute. And a lot of people are like, drown a cat. Well, I'm not going to do a spell where I drown a cat. I like cats. The point is this. Why are you drowning a cat? I said, well, I don't know. Well, who are you calling? Well, it's an invocation of Helios Ion. So what is Helios Ion? Helios Ion is a, a conflation of Helios, the titan of the sun, and Ion, the demiurge and the, the god of, of, uh, of eternity and initiations, that lion-faced body holding two keys surrounded by a serpent like wait a minute what faced lion faced oh ho so the cat is a terrestrial epiphany of this celestial power so perhaps by the instruction drown a cat at the beginning you're exerting power over the celestial spirit by destroying his earthly epiphany you get his attention now it's both illegal and cruel to kill an animal. So if you still want to do this spell, what is the option? Well, if you know Egyptian magic, a lot of that, what they do is these execration texts, they would create officially, as part of the official pharaonic cult, they would create clay objects of the enemies of the emperor, traitors, spies, Nubian kings. They would paint them to look like them. They would cover them in red ink, they would um, write the name of them on them. They would do a magical ceremony, climb with the gods, and they would smash them. And they would do that to pots too. And this was something they ritually did on a daily basis. Magical praxis and curses were an, an official aspect of the Egyptian cult. So you look at that and you're like, okay, they use magic to enliven this clay object to represent this enemy king. And then they destroyed it. So knowing that, why couldn't you, 
create a clay cat, write the word Heliosion or clay cat on it, paint it red. You, there's different spells in the PGM to transmute or enliven something, declare it to be a cat and, um, you know, and that, and shatter the object at the beginning of the spell, and then do the call and the invocation. That is consonant with, it's not just a, a new age modern replacement because we can't bear to kill something. That is consonant with the cultural magic from which this spell derived. An Egyptian sorcerer from 2000 years ago would recognize immediately what you're doing, even if he couldn't understand your words. And he would accept it as a legitimate exercise of magical power. So. <clears throat> very, very cool. Yeah. That's, that's an awesome, awesome way to look at yeah. changing that out and how to, you know, really bring that into a modern practice that is, is actually right. doable. You know, like, yeah, right. Not right. everybody wants to make a ring for success and victory and shove it inside of a chicken for three days. Right. So it's, <laughs> you know, so there's different, different ways to change that, which is absolutely lovely. Yeah. Now we do have another question here for you, Jack, uh, from one of our listeners. And sure. I'm sure you probably get this one all the time with how seemingly unattainable your book is, but, oh. <laughs> but, but are you, ever going to consider perhaps doing a paperback version or offering something that is uh, going to be in more in print you know, or at, at the very least that is, you know, yeah. more accessible or, or is that kind of the mystery of it, that this is meant to be, you know, something that is a, a living thing. You know what I mean? That's fine. Yeah, no, I, I sympathize with people that want to get a hold of it and, and can, and I, I, I really appreciate people's interest um, for sure. I mean, it's been, there have been, I think, three releases of it within the last, I think, four years. So it's, it's, it's been, you know, kind of regularly released in hardback format, which isn't cheap, but, um, but a lot of people who have wanted to get hold of it have been able to. They have been in limited runs. So once they do sell out, they are sold out. And that has been frustrating to some people. I, um, as long as people keep pestering me about it, I'll probably keep doing a release every every you know so often to make sure that people want a copy can have a copy of it uh, you know and, and there will be actually i think there is the a, a friend of mine paul nunez of mana sinestra books uh asked if he could uh publish it in paperback form in um in spanish for a south american audience and i thought that and i told him he could so that's something i'm doing he he pointed out that it it would help um people that that don't always have the same resources as people in the, uh, you know, in, in North America to do it. And I thought that was a fair argument. And I know there's plenty of people in North America that can't, um, you know, set aside a, a solid amount of money for a hardback too. So I, I don't question that. Here's part of the challenge. The books are my attempt to create something beautiful and artistic that's an offering to her. I think hardbacks, are beautiful inherently. I mean, this is a copy of the last one I did. You know, I printed it through my own imprint and, and I was really pleased how it turned out. And to me, it's not just about, you know, uh, not liking paperbacks. I'm trying to create the most beautiful thing I can so that both it's my showing that I respect. I mean, I asked for inspiration and then I wrote what came and this is it. And so when I try to give it physical form, I try to give it the best form I can so that I can show respect for what I was given. And I hope that when people get a copy, if they do, it becomes something precious to them, something that won't fall apart on the flight, you know? Um, and so I do get that people, you know, would, would, would say, well, you know, why don't we do more of these, but it is kind of expensive to, to produce them in this, at this level. And, you know, I, I do what I can is making as many as I can afford to. And then once, once people have bought them up, then, you know, I, I have the resources to consider, should we try to do another one? So part of it is just the practical side of it, you know, and, but the other part is trying to create something beautiful that will last. And the fact that it's not always available to everyone is not entirely, it doesn't leave make me stay awake at night. You know, it, if, if you're, you're younger than me, I think, but you know, when I grew up, you might look for years for a certain copy of a book till you went into one used bookstore and you're like, oh my God, here it is. Like this thing went out of print 20 years ago and here's a copy. I've been looking for this. 
and you got excited and you kept it and you wouldn't lend it out because it took you forever to find it. And that largely went away once we got the internet and you could search on websites, thousands of bookstores at once. And, and there's, a, you know, there's, there's a great side to that and that we could find what we want, but it also very little is scarce anymore. And, um, and it creates, there's a, there's a sense when something's limited, when there's not infinite amounts of it, that it's precious. And to me, the content is precious, not because I wrote it, but because it came to me, that was what I asked for. And that was what I was given. So to me, it's a sign that I'm in relation to her. And so I feel obligated to give it a form that's as beautiful as I can make it. And this is my attempt to do so. And, um, and so I, I think I'll continue along that path unless sort of uh, convinced otherwise. But at this time, you know, I do, you know, I, I do appreciate that, that it can be frustrating to want something that you can't find right away, or that's, you know, prohibitively, um, you know, difficult to get. So I, I hear you. It's, there's a, there's a tension, you know, between trying to create something rare and beautiful and trying to help people that want to experience that work. And, uh, and I'm alive to that. Well, being one of the people that has a copy of the book, I can honestly <laughs> say that, you know, it is well worth the wait if you end up having to wait for it. Mm -hmm. And that, okay. and I believe that that is part of the mystery of it is that, you know, this is something that not everybody has. This is something that if you are truly meant to have it, it will find you. And mm -hmm. it is, uh, you know, like you said, it's a devotion to Hecate. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, the book itself, if anybody knows anything about it, it it's meant to come alive. And so I think you lose a bit of that magic if it becomes something that is accessible to all and is accessible easily. And it's not, in my opinion, this is not a book that is meant to sit on the shelf. This is a book that is meant to very much become a part of your life and a part of your praxis. And so if, if how anybody listening that has wanted a paperback version, how many dozens of paperbacks are sitting on your shelf right now that you maybe read once or you didn't read at all and they have very little meaning to you? And to me, that was worth the wait for me. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, if you do use them, it does reduce the resale value. I will say that. I had, friend, I, had a, I had a friend who saw one being advertised and he contacted them and said like, oh, it was a pretty good price. And the, and the person selling it emailed back and said, yeah, there is um, a chocolate smudge on one of the pages. And there's a pause and my friend said, is it chocolate or is it blood? <laughs> it's a long pause and the person responded, it might be blood. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Who, who would sell a book with a bloody, but your own blood? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Lots of people. It might be more intriguing that way. Well, good point. Good point. I guess people, <laughs> this person. <laughs> So now we do have uh, one last listener question here for you, Jack, and it, it kind of does pertain to your book. Um, so they're saying that, you know, in your nine day initiation, you are in the end, you're putting on the mask of Hikate in one of the last uh, invocations that you're doing. And then you are going and you're doing the initiatory thing. Now, have you found through either with working with Hikate or your practice with the PGM that putting on these deific masks does actually change the magician? Have, have you noticed that there is a conflation there with, you know, how your life changes based on which masks you're putting on? I do think, and that's a very, you know, it's something that wearing masks, you know, is cross-culturally considered, a, you know, a spiritual and artistic act that's transformative. The Egyptians certainly did it. Actors did it in, in Hellenic theater. And certainly in, in African magic, and 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 it's it's a uh, it's is considered transformative so much so that even today, if you're working with masks in a theater performance, there's a very specific protocol as to how you're supposed to touch them, how you're supposed to hang them. You're not supposed to lay them on their face. You're not supposed to grab them by the face. They're supposed to be hung, not you know left lying around. There's really specific protocols because even within even when theater is secular, which it never 100% is, but even when it ostensibly is, there's a sense of respect for these items of power. And a mask, you know, a mask is inherently powerful. And to wear one, I mean, when you use the God face, you're declaring a mask, right? In PGM magic, when you say, I am Yahweh Sabaoth, I am Abda Sax, I am the one who rises and the one who sets it in the West at, at, at dusk, you're putting on a mask verbally by declaring yourself to be something that, you know, is superhuman. 
But if you're using a physical mask, and in my book, I talk about consecrating a mask to Dionysus, you know, if you're using a physical mask, then that experience is heightened because placing, placing a physical mask over the, the body, it sort of relieves you of the obligation to be yourself with most of us find exhausting without even knowing it. You know, the, I remember I was in the room when my grandfather died and when he died, his face relaxed and he looked different than I'd ever seen him before. He looked so much younger. And I thought for the first time in my life, my God, he's really handsome, actually. He, his whole life had been kind of holding his face in a way to look nice and unassuming. And when he relaxed, there was almost a majesty to him. And I'd never noticed. He, he was wearing a mask without probably even noticing it himself. Um, and we do that the same way, the way, I'm, the way I'm holding my face now and the expressions I make and, and everything is, is a mask. Ironically, by putting on a mask, we can drop the mask and we become something that's at once much more universal than this little collections of insecurities and cultural hangups and stuff that I call my face. And so I do think mask work is transformative. I do think masks make great icons and um, idols. Uh, the 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 original the idol of Dionysus at um, the the uh, temple of Delphi was a pillar with a mask on it surrounded by ivy. You know, it wasn't a statue; it was a mask hung in place, and that sends a message. You know, because masks usually aren't hyper realistic. Certainly, they weren't back then. So the idea of the mask is you call upon the spirit by this name and these epithets and this way, but what you're calling upon is is something human that is a placeholder for something unimaginable, something invisible, something daimonic, something that exists beyond the human construction that we have to come up with to address something just because the way we're structured, you know, it helps me to think of Hecate as a, as a beautiful woman, you know, but the fact is she has no body. She's an eternal spirit. She's Titanic. She seems to be the embodiment of liminality of, of thresholds in such a way that she both is at the heart of everything and on the outside of everything, dividing everything and providing the inflection point for everything that, that, that has happened to happen and everything that will happen to become. And so how do you envision that? We can't. The image the idol thing in my head is just a mask for her. So what's fun is we're calling them by certain names with certain imagery in mind and by putting on a mask, whether verbal or literal, it's like masks talking to masks, but the irony is that it allows the real me to reach out and try to touch the real her. So it's an, it's an artificial item, an element, but it has a function and it can be as simple as can be because you can buy a beautiful mask, you know, spend a lot of money. You can make one, which requires some artistry and planning. Or in the simplest, fa in the simplest way, you could get a bit of black translucent cloth and just put it over your face and tie it off. And there's your mask. You're no longer yourself, you know? It's the same thing of putting, you know, a veil over you, which, which used to be common when women wore them. Or even, even Socrates is said to have, you know, put a veil over his face when he was ashamed. There's a sense of, of covering yourself in moments of real intimacy. Uh, and um, and so, so, yeah, I think it's a great bit of tech. It's something we don't do much in the West unless we're doing something very formal, like a, you know, like a ritual play. But I think it does have a role in ritual work and that it can be transformative. Um, yeah. So it's a good question. Very nice. Great explanation, as <laughs> always. <laughs> Thanks. So now here's a question from me, Jack. Um, yeah. It, when you started getting the call and the inkling to work with Hecate, how did how did you know that that was where you were going? How did you how did you get on that path? How did you know that it was Hecate reaching out to you? And how did you know that this would become you know like a lifelong devotion? You know, I didn't. It was by fumbling intuitively in the darkness, the same way <laughs> I stumbled trying to, you know, in the bathroom, trying to reach the, the outlet without knocking over the medicine cabinet. It's just by, by trying to, I think there was a part of me that wanted something that would, I felt that I had plateaued and that I'd sort of, there's a part of me that was either dormant or dead spiritually. 
And I realized that it, it wasn't going to be a subtle fix, that there needed to be something to break the ice. If you want to break six inches of ice, you can't use a toothpick, you need a pickaxe, you know. And so I intuitively reached out towards something that was the opposite of what I had worshipped before, having come from a traditional Christian background, which was a deity that was feminine a de instead of masculine, a deity that was thonic instead of celestial, a deity which was amoral instead of moral, a deity that was transgressive instead of orthodox, and basically looking for the opposite of what I had had in order to get the opposite place that I was now. And, um, and I knew of her because I you know, read the play Macbeth uh, in which she appears and I had some passing knowledge of Greek mythology, but it wasn't like I was like, well, I wanna be a Hellenic. You know, I, I really had no spiritual attraction to you know, the world or I didn't wanna to pretend to be an ancient Greek or something. I wanted to be myself, you know, living now in the world I live in, but I wanted to be guy. I wanted to be in relation to a spiritual power. And I had just lost the ability to connect with the powers that I'd grown up with. And so I thought I'm going to have to try to break this ice with the, you know, the strongest tool I can find. So I called upon the opposite of what I'd always been calling upon. And in my apprehension, something responded and that something both comforted and frightened me. It inspired me. And it also made me alive with, you know, with apprehension uh, for what I was doing. I was worried at first that I had, you know, damned myself because there was a part of me that still has the superstructure of a Christian. And there was a part of me, the way that I was just making it up because I didn't give up being a rational human being just because I decided to engage in spirituality. And there was a part of me that worried I was just trying to, you know, latch on to something cool and spooky as opposed to actually practicing a spiritual path. And so all those concerns, you know, never really left me. But as I continued to do the simplest possible workings, the simplest possible offerings, and try to build them, trying to push myself toward my discomfort zone, thinking if you're comfortable with it, then it's probably you're playing it too safe. So instead of doing everything inside, I started to do things outside. Instead of doing everything during the day, you start doing things at night. Instead of just having it be words, I start using praxis that involved items and objects that were traditionally redolent of her. Instead of just saying, I praise you, say, why don't you promise something? Why don't you commit? Why don't you ask for something? Instead of doing something in a con closed contained area, you know, I had the luck since I'm a, you know, a guy in, in middle age to go out in areas that, that were woods or public and, and practice out in places that were more wild for where I live, but also a bit more nervous making and to keep pushing myself towards and to read, to study, to say, all right, well, what about this PGM thing? It seems such a mess. Let's try and read that, which was a challenge, you know. I read it through seven times, literally, spell by spell, till I began to understand how things were structured and how it worked. And then to be honest with my own working, say, I'm not getting out of anything out of this, but that one thing I did, that really freaked me out. But it seemed it seemed to work. Something about that was different. I need to do that again, even though that's the one that scared me. You know, and 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 sort of trying to lean into the discomfort level, which again is hard because I'm lazy, and I tend to gravitate like water to the lowest possible, you know, level. So it's been a struggle to with myself to identify what I need and how I can go for it in in such a way and be honest about what I'm getting back and feel like I am in relation to this power, and it, and and to deal with the constant challenge of plateauing. And the constant challenge of becoming bored with my own praxis and the constant challenge of trying to make more of what I'm doing than I am or being dishonest about my results. And so there's a continual struggle to keep it real, you know, and um, and writing the book was part of that thing, an attempt to challenge myself to give back what I was giving and teaching the classes was an attempt to to learn more by because you learn, as you know, you learn more by talking about it with people who care. And so the teaching wasn't because I thought, well, I know so much now, I'll share it. It was more like a way to, I need to discover what I know by talking to people about it. And this is how I did it. And I've learned far more teaching these classes than I've, <laughs> than I've done. It's been a lopsided adventure, but I, but I still love it. And I've met some really great friends and they've taught me a lot. When I see their practice and their results and their tradition, people you know, people who are from initiated traditions, people who have spent decades of ceremonial magic, people who are so intuitive, people who are true mystics, visionaries, and people who are just, just people like me, but have great ideas and really good work ethic. 
I'm like, oh my God, that's what it looks like. That's it. And seeing that has made it more real to me because I can see people other than myself getting results and having experiences and seeing epiphanies and beholding, you know, the results in their own lives and sharing, you know, the results. When I mix these two systems, here's what did work, here's what didn't. And so it's been a journey and not like that, you know, it's like that. And it continues to be. And I continue to increasingly get bored of my own, you know, praxis and, and you know, doubt my own, uh, you know, worthiness to do this work. But I continue to do it more out of stubbornness than anything. And the fact that I'm grateful for having been allowed, I feel, to have come into relation with a power that is so remarkable and yet so undefinable. And that defies expectations and is truly challenging to what we think of when we think of the divine, you know, because mm -hmm. there's a tendency, and I'm not the only one, to make it to, to project upon divinity that it's safe and that it's good. When is the fact is if it's real, they're not safe and they're not good because they're great. And so it's very much like trying to approach, you know, a grizzly bear or a great white shark. Are they good? Are they bad? They're neither one. They're themselves. They're full of power, you know, and they have protocols and ex expectations based on who they are and what they are and how you present. But to get close to them and to feel like you've actually brushed them with your hand, I mean, there's nothing greater. And so that's, you know, that's what keeps me going. And that's, I think, you know, you guys both know that that journey in search of that experience of imminence, of the numinous, that's the thing that makes in a, in a large way a spiritual life worth living. So that's, that's the chase, right? Absolutely. So good. <laughs> so, so good. This has been amazing, Jack. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of fun for me too. I really appreciate you being <laughs> open to talk about this with such good questions. It's it's a real privilege to talk to you, people like you that you know that base your life around sharing mysteries and helping people awaken to the wonders of you know their spiritual life and things like that. It's really cool. Yeah, th thank you for coming on today, Jack. It yeah, absolutely. A, a true pleasure, and you know the way that you approach these things is it's just it's such a breath of fresh air from you know some of the some of the way that we see things presented <laughs> in the occult communities or you know in, in any of the even in the pgm you have the people that are you know it has to be done with the the blood of a black dog and if you don't have it it can't be done and you know okay. so it, 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 it's a very refreshing and honest take yeah. of you know somebody who has walked the walk and i yeah, I, I absolutely appreciate that Cool. Thank I completely you. enjoy your style. It's, oh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm in awe of it. Oh, so thank you so very, very much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you again. It's a real pleasure being on your show. I think it's a great show. And I, I look forward to talking to you guys again. Awesome. Yeah, we would love to have you again sometime in the future, sure. if you're willing. <laughs> be wonderful. Once I get further down in the course, we'll have to do this again. And I'll <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a good deal. Of questions, right? <laughs> That's a good deal. That's a good deal. It's a date. Awesome. So if anybody listening to this is interested, Jack has another cohort of the Hail Hecate course is coming up, I believe, at the end of this month. So I, I believe it's on the 30th it starts. Is that That's right? right. May, May 30th is, uh, is when it goes up. So let me know. Fantastic. And uh, if I'm correct, people don't need your book to take the class, correct? No, no, no. Right. The, the, the course is different from the book. So you don't you don't need one to take the other. Awesome. Fantastic. So check out the Blackthorn School and Jack Grail's classes as you have heard from his absolutely stunning and wonderful explanations. <laughs> Jack is a fantastic teacher and we cannot recommend him enough. So thank you all for tuning into this episode and we will see you in the next one.